Vegas, I really hope I do this interview justice, man. It is 1140 The Bet. Adrian Hernandez here. About to bring someone responsible for a big part of my childhood. uh, Responsible for my parents buying pay-per-views growing up. And the reason I read a book this weekend. Brian Gewertz joins us. Former head writer of WWE Now with Seven Bucks Productions and Young, Young Rock on NBC. And also the author of There's Just One Problem, True Tales from the Former One-Time Seventh Most Powerful Man in WWE, available now. Today is release day. Get it wherever you get your books, from Amazon to independent bookstores, Barnes & Nobles, wherever. Uh, Brian, thank you for joining us, and I'll start by asking you this simple question. Uh, Does it count as reading a book if you listen to the audiobook version? Yeah, it, it definitely. First of all, Adrian, thank you for having me on. Um, it, it definitely counts. It's not my voice um, who's reading it because I think, you know, my voice, I think scientifically like 10 minutes of exposure to my voice uh, makes people want to very much either hang up the phone or, uh, you know, put away their audio book if history is any indication. But, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's voiced by someone um, much smoother than me. Um, but, you know, reading is also fun, too, but both of them count. <laughs> And I can still read, so thank you for making me opening up a book. And, you know, since we are a sports station, uh, and I know you're a huge Mets fan, uh, much to Shane McMahon's dismay from reading the first chapter of the book. Um, (laughs) But I want to ask you, uh, what's the closest thing in sports that resembles a WWE entrance other than Edwin Diaz's entrance coming into games from the bullpen for the Mets? Yeah, you know, that's that's what I was going to probably go to, uh, Edwin Diaz. You know they they they're doing that down pat right to like the camera behind them and everything and not going to commercial and just following them all the way out there. You know I think, you know maybe because I associate the music so much because it was the same music the Chicago Bulls used in the '80s was the music that Ricky the Dragon Steamboat used. Yeah. In, you know WWF rings. So those things always you know I always got the same chills even though I was rooting against Jordan Pippen. Uh, Grant and all the Bulls, and they would beat my Knicks literally every single year except one. So, yeah, those are, uh, you know, WWE, you know, whether you're loving the show, not liking the show, they do presentation really, really well, and establishing a song with a character and a persona, and you instantly know who it is by just, like, the opening note of them coming out. It's something that they really do well, and it's cool to see other sports kind of trying to emulate it now. Yeah, I don't know if you saw Edwin's uh, entrance this weekend where they actually, when he was in the bullpen, they black and white. It was black and white on the screen, and then the moment he stepped onto the outfield, absolutely incredible. Um, But let's get into this book, and I know you did the Cheap Heat podcast, um, and I, I, I heard you speaking on how you're listening and you're seeing Bruce Pritchard's success, and you're like, this is what he just used to tell us as we're driving to the next city on a regular day around work. So I'm, I'm curious to you, why now? Why a book instead of a podcast? Um, you know, it's a good question. One of you know, the main reason is because, you know, I, I remember what I remember really well, but there's a ton of stuff I don't remember. Like, you know, in the process of, you know, doing interviews and, and talking about the book, you know, people will bring it up like, oh, well, you obviously remember when Kurt Angle fought Randy Orton on SmackDown in November of 2005. <laughs> I'm like, um, no, I don't. I have <laughs> literally no recollection of that. I'm positive that it happened. I'm sure it did. Um, but, you know, in listening to Bruce's podcast with Conrad Thompson, you know, they, they obviously do their research beforehand, and Bruce rewatches the show and everything. Um, but yeah, I, I, there's a lot of things, you know, it would be a very boring podcast of like, yeah, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it happened, <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. But the stuff I do remember, you know, like I, you know, cause WWE moves so fast. It's not like, you know, I'm this, you know, um, Mr. Magoo or something like you gave me a little scare, by the way, at the beginning of the introduction, because it's like, he wrote the stuff that I grew up with. I thought you were going to say he wrote the stuff my parents grew up with. No, no, the just stuff me, my just grandparents me. grew up with <laughs> I'm like, I'm still in my forties technically, but, um, yeah, no, it, this was like, you know, like a comedian. I was talking about this the other day, like a comedian has their sets, uh, that they, you know, it's like, wow, they're, they're when they go on stage, 
yes, they're like reciting an hour of stuff, but it's not like they're sitting down trying to memorize an hour because it just is something they've told over and over and over again that they have that rhythm and it just comes naturally to them. And a lot of these stories, not all of them, but a lot of them uh, are ones that I've like been telling friends over the years or family members or people like within my close, you know, inner circle and what have you. And you know, the the fact that Bruce would would tell like these stories that that I remember him telling us that he, you know, launched into this massive podcast and I don't know how many like it seems like he's coming out with a new shirt every other week. Um, <laughs> including all the Michael Hayes stuff that he just took from me imitating Michael Hayes and has now launched a uh, empire of uh, Michael Hayes, like they're selling fanny packs, um, you know, all that stuff. And it's like, you know what? I think Bruce uh, and Conrad, and there's a ton of people uh, like Eric Bischoff and JR, like and, and Jericho, you know, they're great uh, in the podcast medium. Um, I'd rather, you know, I always preferred as a, as a television writer for WWE anyway, to kind of like work by myself in, you know, uh, in the dark, um, you know, typing away on a computer and working at my own pace and being able to truly think it out um, and get these stories down. And as, you know, I was putting it together, some of the stories are like, yeah, ones, like I said, that, I, that I've told friends and stuff like that. And then there was just a lot of like, you know, truly, you know, looking that stuff up on Google and, and re-triggering my memory, um, and stuff that I hadn't told anybody. Um, there's a story about <laughs> this secret war I had in my head uh, against The Undertaker that's in the book that I literally have never told a soul until I put it into this uh, chapter. So, yeah, it was fun. And, you know, the the pandemic, um, you know, the obviously side effects was a lot of people, you know, sitting at home not watching sports um, with a lot of time on their hands. You know, and I tried to take advantage of that a little bit to just take my mind off of, you know, what everyone was experiencing in the world. And, you know, that's when the process really started. And, Brian, I do want to apologize real quick because I just realized I asked the writer why he wrote a book. Um, so I'm sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> um, and uh, I was lucky enough. Hey, I've never written a book before, so it's a, it's a fair question. See, thank you. Thank you for making me feel better. I appreciate that. And yeah. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to to get the book over the weekend uh, and kind of read through. So I'm probably around page 80. I went ahead and and, list, and read the Once in a Lifetime chapter because I had to because uh, all my college tuition money I saved up was wasted on driving down to Miami. <laughs> but before we get to that, um, I appreciate, number one, that the book kind of – there's no fluff. I mean, you talk about getting into wrestler's court it, it, at, at the first page, and it goes through very quickly, and you kind of talk about your passion – and how you grew up as a lifelong fan. And for me, being in the radio, I've been in sports radio for the past eight months. And I've always wanted to do sports radio. And I finally ended up here. And I've caught myself as the NFL is getting ready to kick off the regular season in this training camp. I've been able to go to the, the Raiders training camp and be in the, the press room and ask the coaches questions. And I've had to go to the car and be like, holy crap, this is what I've always wanted to do. And I'm finally getting to do it. And it's a little intimidating. And I'm wondering for you, being a fan and caring so much, like that's awesome. But that also, there had to be hesitancy. And how did you get over that to be able to be in this room and start pitching questions and this, that, and the third and kind of, you know, standing your ground on what you believed in and what you thought was best for the show? Yeah, it's a real interesting question because that, and this surprises people when I've mentioned it before, but I was never... You know, I was nervous maybe like, you know, in the backstage when we were shooting and meeting all these different people and, you know, any any kind of, you know, natural nervousness that, you know, gets involved when you're the new kid and, and you have to, uh, you know, in, ingrate yourself to uh, culture and, and the locker room and you're not taking bumps and you're quote-unquote management, like all that stuff, there's definitely growing pains and trying to get more comfortable. But in the room, pitching ideas to Vince – and pitching like storylines, I actually really was never nervous in that respect, um, and, and mainly for two reasons. One, um, you know, I had like like you in sports, I had always wanted to be a sitcom writer, and, and I got to do that, um, and I had got to work with my uncle, uh, who is a prolific sitcom writer. He had written on shows like Taxi, and was the showrunner on Wings and Larry Sanders, and bosom buddies with Tom Hanks. It was something I always wanted to do. And we got to work together, 
you know, him as the showrunner, me as a as a staff writer on the, you know, on the Jenny McCarthy sitcom on NBC. And so it was a very a brief classic. period of time. <laughs> yeah, thank you, because it wasn't on the air long. <laughs> um, but, you know, he, he told me, you know, because I was very timid and, you know, not wanting to disappoint. And the biggest fear of, like, throwing out a joke and nobody laughing. Are you kidding? How could I possibly live with that? Um, you know, and he put it in no uncertain terms, like, you need to – speak up and pitch your jokes because if you're just going to be sitting there um there's a ton of people a ton of talented people who could take that spot you know and, and be productive so you you really need to shape, shape up otherwise you know we're going to have to end this so that was a huge wake up call for me and ever since then it was kind of like all right well I got to I'll put fear aside for the day and I got to like start pitching jokes and 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 that carried over to WWE too because that happened you know, within a year or so of joining WWE. So that mentality, you know, which was really strongly ingrained in my brain, I took into, it was a lot more pressure to pitch a joke in front of my uncle for me than it was for Vince, you know, to pitch to Vince McMahon. You know, because in the back of my mind, the second thing was always like, it was my dream to be a television writer. It was never my dream to be a WWE writer. This is the path yeah. that I've taken. Um, but I, you know, if I bomb here, great, I go back to sitcom. So it's not that big a deal. So in, in some ways the pressure was off. And that, and that's why, cause in, in you write in the book in your head, you're like, Oh, no, I'm going to be here two or three years. Like this will, let me, you know, dip my toes in it. And, and it's basically that because this wasn't, although you were a mega fan, you were going to WrestleMania's, uh, sneaking into beyond the map premieres, this, that, and the third and traveling <laughs> to go to these shows, you still were like, this isn't my dream though. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, it's, you know, I, as, as you pointed out, I'll, I will watch every Mets game I could possibly watch, if not attend. You know, when we were shooting Young Rock in Australia and the, you know, there would be a Saturday 1 10 p.m. game, which for Australia time was 3 10 in the morning. Um, you know, I wasn't trying to, but I would just biologically wake up and I'm like, oh, well put on my MLB.com app and watch it. The Grom's like pitching work for the Mets. <laughs> yeah, well, the Grom's pitching. You have to wake up. Um, you know, that's like a holiday. But it was not. You know, if like an opportunity presented itself to work for the Mets, um, you know, that's my that's my fandom and everything. But it's not something I ever really wanted. You know, considered for a career. And it was the same with WWE. So you know, it's one of those things where. Um, you know, once you're there, you, you try to make it uh, work as much as possible and you put everything into it uh, because that culture and that environment, you will, uh, you know, drown if you're not 100% committed to it. Um, but, yeah, in terms of the pressure and everything, it was much, much more socially than it was work-wise. And, and trying to go a little inside baseball in the, in the mechanics of being a writer. So if I could take it to what's going on right now, um, past few weeks, of course, Triple H has taken over as creative. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed, you know, little differences of, you know, like last on the, the previous Monday Night Raw, Drew McIntyre told Kevin Owens, hey, we're wrestlers in a wrestling ring. Let's wrestle. Or they mentioned and they said hospital and that they're giving some of the the, the wrestlers themselves more freedom uh, in, in terms of their promos and stuff like that. And I guess from your perspective as a writer, how do you feel about that, about giving the freedom to the, to the wrestlers and be like, no, you, this is, this is your character. You live with it 24 seven, go out there and you know, the character better than anyone else. Yeah. It's that fine line, right? Because, uh, you know, uh, in some respects, yes, the characters, the, the performers need to live, eat, breathe their personas and it will be better than anything. Oftentimes, anything anyone else can come up with, you know, will pale in comparison to what you can bring to the table yourself. Um, there's other, you know, instances, though, where it helps to have a writer there to be able to take down what you're thinking. And if you have, like, you know, a 20-minute match in addition to this long promo segment, like, hey, I trust you. Here's what I'm going for. Here's what you're going for as a writer of the show and knowing you know, the, the context and the totality of everything that's going on, not only this week, but hopefully weeks ahead, um, you know, put that into something, you know, yeah. in, in form of something I could look at, and then I could add to it, I could take out, you know, there were plenty of times when I was like working, like one of my favorite angles that I was able to work with on 
was Chris Jericho, Shawn Michaels, you know, that extended long serious angle that they did and involved Shawn's wife, it involved multiple pay-per-views, and that was really one of the most rewarding parts of, you know, my time there was being able to like meet early before even the production meeting uh with Shawn and Chris and sit down and just go, go hey, here's here's what we're trying to accomplish today. Here's the first draft of something that I've written. Um, you know, read it over. What are your guys' thoughts? And then, you know, taking their input, and they would have a lot of input because they were so committed to the angle, uh, obviously. Um, and then I would be able to just, you know, take all of that, get it down, you know, being able to present it to Vince, who, you know, was, was looking to approve everything at the time. Um, but that's so much more rewarding than, you know, if you're in a position where, you know, at the time sitting with Vince and Vince just starts kind of rattling a promo off the top of his head, and then, you know, you're transcribing it. You're not really even a writer at that point. Yeah. You're a transcriber. And then handing it over to the talent and being like, and they're like, what is this? And I'm like, well, it's approved, so there you go. Well, could we change it? Well, there's a long line outside of his office. So I don't know if we'll have time to change it. You know, that's, that's happened in the past. Um, I, I don't know for certain, but it certainly seems like, the tide is shifting as far as like having a little bit more leeway. Not that Vince didn't give people leeway because he did, but there was a lot of people and a lot of times where, you know, the mindset was this is a television show just like any other television show. You know, there's no other television show really uh, on, you know, in an entertainment form that is, you know, they just go, okay, performers, um, you know, go out and just say whatever you want. You know, there's some sort of... Um, you know, knowledge of what is going to be said. The production truck often needs to know what's said so they can make their right cuts and, and or cut to the crowd if there's a big pop line. So it's really, you know, um, it's a combination of so many things that I think the perfect blend is when you get a writer and wrestlers together, you're able to work on it together. Sometimes the wrestlers do the majority of it. Sometimes the writers contribute a little bit more than you would expect. But when it's something that everyone's comfortable with and that bond and that trust exists, then, you know, it's, that's, that's where usually the, the magic happens. And, and thank you so much because one of the questions I was going to ask you is like the ideal work scenario, although how many times do you really get that? Because scripts can change an hour up into Raw or a pay-per-view or whatever the case. And, you know, on, on that same pathway of giving certain wrestlers kind of the leeway to do things, uh, just as a fan, one of the things I appreciated that you mentioned in the chapter, the once-in-a-lifetime kind of breaking down the three-year run in rivalry with Cena and Rock is how The Rock and Cena, obviously they're superstars. They can handle their promos by themselves. But early on, you know, as a fan watching, there were some of the moments where it's like, oh, this is going on a little too long. And Cena keeps talking about his hashtags. And The Rock keeps talking about boots to asses. And I wonder from, like, your perspective and the writer's room where you guys notice that uh, this needs a little, you know, this needs a little focus or a little bit of guidance, but... How are you going to tell them with everything that they've accomplished? And then also beyond the screen of we need to make this work that, yes, they both view themselves as the greatest of all time and the ego and everything that comes with that. Well, you know, a lot of that just comes with working with people over the years and gaining that trust and gaining, you know, that, that um, you know, level of relationship where, it's not someone who just first started. So as, as over as, you know, Rock and Cena were at the time, you know, from a writer's perspective, you know, I had credibility too, you know, in terms of like when they were doing their angle, I had been there and in that position for over a decade at that point. And they're, they're very, very cool and, and acknowledge the fact like someone like this, you know, who's been doing this job especially for a decade plus, you know, it's not someone just like who's just come off the street and is now saying, no, you should say this. You know, the level of respect, you know, always went both ways, which was really cool. Um, so, yeah, that was that was definitely helpful, like, you know, in terms of being able to try to navigate between that. Um, and that, you know, and then again, that chapter, uh, you know, it definitely uh, took years off of my WWE life just because the stakes were so high and the tension was so real and thankfully, it all came, you know, when it finally all got together, it came together in, in, in harmony with everybody, with, uh, you know, Rock and Cena being on great terms now. Um, but it took a little while to get there, and it was, you know, not a smooth journey. And people, and the coolest thing 
was as, as stressful as it was for me backstage, like the fans could feel it. The fans could see the tension. They knew that like this isn't just parts that they're playing because so many of you know the the, the heat between John and, and Rock um, you know was occurring outside of WWE television. It was occurring with John doing you know interviews for I think a UK newspaper that sparked it all and cutting a promo that in Australia that was after the show and Rock cutting promos on his Facebook that were oh, you the know, Facebook promos. longer <laughs> more personal yeah than the. Uh, what you'd see in the ring. So fans knew, like, wait a second, this is not the normal, you know, WWE quote-unquote storyline angle that, you know, we're accustomed to. Um, and, you know, as detailed in the book, it was, you know, my job to try to corral it back together as best I can and, and get them both on the same page. And I do want to let you know, just as a fan, and I was going to school in college in Tampa, and I used all my financial aid to go down to Miami for WrestleMania and the Hall of Fame and everything. <laughs> I want to give you guys credit because the coolest thing was that Walmart next to Dolphin Stadium. I think it's Hard Rock Stadium, whatever it's called now. Um, walking into that Walmart around 11 a.m., everyone in that, number one, it was filled to the brim like it was Black Friday. But everyone was talking about that match and, and who, who they wanted to win and this, that, and the fourth. And I know we don't have too much time with you because you got a lot more people to talk to. It's release day. Uh, Brian Gowertz joins us here on 1140 The Bet Las Vegas. Brand new book just came out today. There's just one problem. True Tales from the former one-time seventh most powerful man in WWE. Available now wherever you get your books. One last note um, on the Rock Cena rivalry. Obviously, your relationship with The Rock is highly documented and then continues today. Um, the one thing I, I want to ask you about in knowing The Rock for so long, you know, when Cena goes out there, and I think it was the Raw in Portland or somewhere in the West Coast, when he goes out there and he mentions that Rock, yes, you know, kind of breaks the fourth wall and says, yeah, I don't need my promo notes on, on my wrist um, and on my arm. Obviously, in the moment, you can see you can see The Rock like there's, there's something changed in his eye. But from that moment and back and coming backstage, did you notice uh, like I guess the equivalent of of a basketball game when you have LeBron and Kobe or whatever, and one does something incredible and they're like, "No, that's cool," but now it's my turn. Did you notice a shift in intensity or something change in The Rock after that promo? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's a human nature thing. If you if you go out there, and I know, like you know, in John's mind. You know, this was this was going into battle. You know, and all's fair in battle, because you know, as I wrote in the book, he pointed out, you know, before I could even say anything, because John was through the curtain, I think before Rock was, um, and I was of course backstage, a gorilla position, that area right behind the curtain, and John was like, hey, uh, if you see it on TV, it's fair game, you know, because we had monitors up there, so I think that's where he he caught wind of it, um, and it wasn't like it was you know, like a whole promo written out. It's like promo is like flexing a muscle, you know. Um, and, you know, when you're, when you're like doing movies on a Hollywood set uh, and you're basically doing a couple pages for the entire day uh, and then, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're like kind of thrust back into WWE and you're cutting a 20-minute monologue um, without the benefit of any like retakes or teleprompters or cue cards or anything like that, you know, it's a thing that I remember Roddy uh, used to do all the time. Just, like, put a couple of key words, uh, not to refer to it, um, you know, but to have it just in case you need it. it. You know, and Rock, being third generation, is as old school as they come. So, you know, he would do that, um, you know, on very rare occasions. But, you know, if it's after a long layoff, like, yeah, it's good to have as a safety net. You know, it's not like he was, you know, just like all of a sudden looking at his, you know, his arm to remember where he was because, you know, once he goes out there, it becomes like a, and excuse the New York City police I love fire it. I love uh, it. truck alarm. It happens literally every time I talk to anybody. Um, He's talking about the book. He's talking yeah. about the book. <laughs> yeah, please. The fire could wait. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was definitely a breach of trust in the moment because that's just not something you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to be, like, you know, kind of betray the trust of your dance partner out there because you need that trust between opponents, no matter how, you know, uh, how, how bloody and violent or what have you, like the, the actual match might be, you're working together. You're not really fighting each other. 
So, you know, that trust was violated that night. And it wasn't like, you know, Rock wasn't like shook or anything. He, I think it was just like, I don't think he appreciated it. But I think it was more of like, you know, I think what you were alluding to, which is like, all right, this is how it's going to be now. That's how it's going to be. We're, uh, you know, we're not going to, I'm not going to, you know, try to break the fourth wall. You know, that's not his style. That's not what he does. But we want to ramp up the intensity. We want to make this as real as possible. Uh, He's more than down to do that. And Brian, real quick, uh, because I know we're pressed for time. Do you have a couple more minutes for a few more questions? Yeah, I think so. All right, perfect. So I guess we'll we'll do this quickly. Some some storylines throughout your career. If you could give me a couple sentences on them, and then I want to close out with a TV question, just in general. Um, so we'll 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 stick with everything in in the wrestling world. Uh, when it comes to the Raw Anonymous General Manager, was there ever a payoff planned? Um, so that storyline, like uh, who ran over Stone Cold when that happened, it was one of those things where, you know, and I'm not saying this is the correct mindset, but the mindset was, we don't have to worry about who it is Oh, now. you guys didn't um, know. I you know, knew it. <laughs> the beauty is in the gimmick. We'll figure it out when it's, when it's time to figure it out. Um, that does not to say that a lot of writers didn't have ideas, but I think, I think Vince especially was just more... He became much more uh, into the the Michael Cole heat of reading the announcement than who was actually secretly making the announcement. Oh, what you know, and that manifested itself in this Michael Cole heel character that actually had a match, and I think he went over uh, Jerry Lawler at WrestleMania. Still undefeated so, at yeah, WrestleMania. Yeah, it was like, yeah, yeah, Jerry Lawler, wrestling legend, defeated by Michael Cole. It's in history books, etched in stone. Who also, Jerry Lawler still doesn't have a win in WrestleMania history. Good Lord. Uh, gotta love it, though. Um, Booker T versus Triple H at WrestleMania 19. Why didn't Booker T get some shine? So I don't know if you mean, like, shine in the match or why didn't he go over? Why didn't he go over, um, I guess I should yeah. say. <laughs> so, yeah. No, we, I, I talked about this a little bit, too, recently. Um, this is one of those things where... It was certainly considered, and I was, I mean, like I could say I was definitely a proponent of it because I had, first of all, from a storyline standpoint, after everything, you know, like Booker is the underdog in that match, and Triple H is the big bad, and, you know, after going through, like, this whole buildup to it, it's a satisfying payoff to see the hero defeat the villain in that particular case. But that was also, you know, without getting too into the weeds, um, you know, that was also a case of, at the time, it was very much like we got to make sure the things that we're spotlighting are, you know, nothing takes away from that. So I know on that particular show, you know, Brock in the main event was being crowned as the new champion, beating Kurt Angle, uh, doing that crazy um, um, Brock Star Splash, I, I believe. Of course, I'm now. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. You know, and, and it almost ending disastrously. I know it was like the big culmination of Mr. McMahon versus Hulk Hogan. Uh, with Roddy doing a run-in, and whether right or wrong, I think the the mindset at this time was like, well, this is the you know the Raw title match that's like third, fourth to last on the card or whatever. Um, you know, it, it would get the the moment would be lost in the totality of the show. Um, you know, if we pulled the trigger and made a new champion. Again, I'm not saying that that was the correct decision or even one that I was necessarily in agreement with at the time, but I think that was the mindset, which was. You know, uh, let's keep let's let's make sure that the spotlight is you know focused in this particular case on Brock. And I know you've been asked this a million times, uh, so I guess I kind of want to get specific. But when it comes to Cena uh, and the heel turn, uh, and I know you've said uh, at nauseum that yes, there were discussions. I guess was there a specific point where it was the closest to actually happening? So yeah, this is. And again, uh, every time there's a really, really good question, that's when all hell breaks loose on Third Avenue right outside uh, my apartment. I don't know what's going on. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember. You know, there was definitely a height um, sometime, I think, in between Edge winning the Money in the Bank contract and cashing it in on him and before Cena versus Rock. So you're probably talking – Somewhere in the you know in the 2007 2008 era, um, where you know I know we as writers had reached the saturation point as far as 
John, you know, as as fans, you know, would sometimes call Super Cena coming in and winning all the time. So it wasn't even necessarily um, purely a reaction to the fans, or half of which were booing him anyway, so much as just from a writing perspective and a storyline perspective, um, similar, you know, in some respects to Hogan turning and joining the NWO, it would just be such a seismic shift that the television themselves can't help but get more interesting because, you know, you really haven't seen this side of John since his, you know, early rapping days when he would be, you know, rapping at a at a graveyard and cutting promos on The Undertaker and stuff before he, you know, became the whole chain gang, you know, hustle, loyal, and respect guy. So it was probably during that time. I, I wish I could remember a specific angle or a specific time, but, you know, ultimately it didn't happen, and I think there was just too much, you know, outside of the ring at stake, um, you know, for WWE to pull the trigger on it. But like I've said, you know, John, John can do anything. John, you've seen him, you know, yeah. pretty much pull off anything in movies and in the ring, um, and it really would have been cool to see what would happen. And then my last question, uh, kind of want to do a 180 um, and just talk about television in general because here on the show that I do, um, we, we talk about it a lot and streaming and how everything's kind of changing. And I kind of want to get your perspective as a writer when you look at the news about like the Discovery and HBO Max and HBO merger um, and them kind of letting go and changing, you know, HBO, one of the premier places to make television and some of these other streaming services kind of merging together. And honestly, after like a 10 or 15 year bubble to start to see people being like, you know what, Netflix, you're canceling shows after one or two seasons and there's not really much for me to watch. This is like one of the first times where people are like, I don't need to spend that $15 this month because it used to be $8, but now it's 15 And obviously everything going on in the world, like what's your perspective in terms of, I guess, television and streaming and where it's at today? Because it feels like it's at a, a changing point for the first time. Yeah, it's really unpredictable. And, you know, when your job, as, as my net job now is, you know, as part of development for 7 bucks, which is, you know, Dwayne Johnson, Danny Garcia's company, to develop and sell and pitch television shows, um, you know, you, you kind of, you know, need to keep track of that. And, it, and it's alarming sometimes, you know, you're seeing networks' mandates changing and they're into this type of show. Now they're not into that type of show. The exec that you grew a relationship with over here has now left the company all of a sudden. Uh, and then a new exec is coming in who has a different mindset and a different mandate. So, you know, from a, you know, behind the scenes selling television pers- show perspective, uh, it's definitely, you know, this kind of wild west, unpredictable landscape. And from a consumer standpoint, I would imagine, too, I mean, I got a little nervous before, like, wait a minute, I like all my HBO Max shows and the original stuff, the movies, the, you know, being able to um, watch any season of any HBO show that I want. Is it, is it going away? Or the, what, what's happening? Okay, is it becoming Discovery? Okay, now they're merging together, so there'll still be... Is a false alarm. Everything is still going to be there. Okay, great. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely it's it's you know I hate to say it's just like uncharted waters, but you know it is it's, though it's evolving and changing so fast. Yeah, it really is. Um, there's there's no like definitive statement that you can make knowing like well in two years it's all going to be this. Maybe someone can make it. I can't because I don't know what's going on. All you could do it's the same kind of mindset in wrestling. It's like all you could do is worry about yourself and try to come up with great ideas for television shows and pitch them and develop them um, and, you know, let the landscape, you know, that that will take care of itself. Just worry about you. And, and Brian, listen, I don't want to get yelled at by everyone because I know we we're, we're supposed to go 25 minutes, but the conversation went longer, and, and it could go on for hours with everything that you've been a part of. But we want to thank you for the time. Uh, Brian Gawart to joining us, former head writer of WWE, now with 7 Bucks Production, a part of Young Rock that airs on ABC. And it is release day. His book just came out, There's Just One Problem. True tales from the former one-time seventh most powerful man in WWE. I promise you it's worth the read. It's worth the listen if you're an audiobook person. But, Brian, thank you so much for the time. I greatly appreciate it. Adrian, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Of course. There he is. Brian Gortz joining us, of course, on the podcast and everything. We'll get you the link on social media to buy the book. I promise you it is a must-listen. It's 1140 The Bet Las Vegas with Adrian Hernandez.